Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sandro Peruza. I'm the CEO of the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. As some of you might already know, March is National Engineering Month. Thank you for joining us. Before we begin, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge that we're coming to you from Toronto, which is a dish with one spoon territory. We respectfully acknowledge the past and present traditional stewards of the land and their unique role in the life of this region. Toronto is on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee and the Wendat people and is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. As settlers, we are grateful for the opportunity to live, work and play in this great territory. Today, we are gathered to discuss small modular reactors and the future of new nuclear energy, a policy file that has seen tremendous advancement and exciting news lately. In the energy domain, OSPI constantly advocates for effective energy policies at both the provincial and federal levels of government to ensure a safe, reliable, affordable, sustainable, and abundant energy supply for businesses and residents. OSPI supports Canada's Small Modular Reaction or SMR Action Plan and applauds Ontario's progress and investments in nuclear energy. OSPI supports the development of SMRs because nuclear energy is known to be an effective way to reduce atmospheric emissions, including greenhouse gases. A review of major industrial jurisdictions confirms that dependable, low emission electricity can be produced affordably with a combination of nuclear energy and hydroelectricity for a base load electricity requirement. As a contributor to Canada's SMR action plan, OSPI is committed to a set of actions to seize the SMR opportunity for Canada and for Ontario. These include engaging both non-nuclear engineers and the general public to help them understand the role that nuclear energy and SMRs can play in meeting both our energy and our environmental goals. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. First, we'll hear remarks from our keynote speaker, followed by a panel discussion with leaders in the nuclear sector. So now we'll begin. I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, the Honorable Todd Smith, Minister of Energy. For over 25 years, Todd Smith has been a trusted voice in the Quinty region. A graduate of Loyalist College, he embarked on a 16 year career in radio broadcasting serving as the voice of Belleville Bulls Hockey and rising to news director at Quinty Broadcasting. Todd was first elected in 2011 in the riding of Prince Edward Hastings. While in opposition, he served as a PC critic for several portfolios, including the Energy File. In 2018, he was elected in a new Bay of Quinty riding as part of the Doug Ford government. He has served as the government house leader, minister of government and consumer affairs, Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, and now serves as Ontario's Minister of Energy. Good afternoon, Minister. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Sandro, for the introduction and uh, great to be with all of you here this afternoon. And I've had the opportunity to work with uh, OSPI over the last uh, many years, uh, including Paul, uh, for a long period of time uh, back when I was the opposition critic for energy. So uh, it is really great to, to be here with you this afternoon and have the opportunity to speak to some of the exciting progress that we're making in Ontario and across Canada 
as our world-class energy sector is now in what we call a new power play, uh, to tie in the old Belleville Bulls uh, hockey analogy there. Um, since this is National Engineering Month, it's also a perfect opportunity to express my appreciation for the direct role that your membership continues to play in helping Ontario achieve an electricity system that's over 90% emissions free, making ours really one of the cleanest grids in the entire world. And since our government came to office, we've been focused on building an energy system that all Ontarians can participate in, uh, a system that's affordable, reliable, and sustainable, and one that gives consumers choice and control over the energy that they use, while at the same time providing businesses with a cleaner energy advantage that gives them confidence to make investments that have far-reaching benefits for our environment, our labor force, and our economy. Since day one, we've taken many steps towards fulfilling that division early in our mandate, our focus was on getting soaring energy costs under control after thousands of over-market contracts were signed by the previous government. And with significant work and investment by our government, we're now in a better place. We're in a place where electricity rates for businesses are more competitive than a lot of other North American jurisdictions. And that means as we look ahead, we can really focus on the work that we have underway to make Ontario a leader in economic growth and clean energy with renewable natural gas and low carbon hydrogen and electrification. And uh, as we're here to talk about today, we're exploring new solutions in our world-class nuclear industry and its cutting edge advancements in medical isotopes and small modular reactors. As we all know, nuclear power is the foundation. It's the, it's the backbone of Ontario's clean energy advantage. It provides reliable, uh, competitively priced and zero emissions power that makes up about 60% of the province's electricity supply every day. And that's why it was uh, a great pleasure to be in Regina on Monday this week. Uh, just a couple of days ago to announce that the SMR strategic plan is rolled out with my provincial partners from Saskatchewan, New Brunswick and Alberta. With this plan, we're staking a place for Canada as a world leader in the next evolution of nuclear technology, those SMRs, the small modular reactors. With our robust nuclear supply chain and experienced nuclear operators, Ontario comes to the table uniquely positioned to advance SMR innovation, development, and deployment. And we're already playing a leadership role with Canada's first grid scale small modular reactor planned to be completed before the end of the decade at the Darlington site. This project is gonna establish our reputation as a first mover in this cutting edge technology. I say it all the time, the world is watching what we're doing here in Ontario. We're, we're already making progress on that project back in December, alongside Ontario Power Generation and GE Hitachi. Uh, we announced GE Hitachi's BWRX 300 as the selected technology for the site. And earlier this month, we announced early preparation work, which I'm sure you'll hear about during the discussion later today with OPG. And uh, I saw Lisa here from uh, GE Hitachi as well. As uh, the team at OPG likes to say, we're literally paving the way to preparing for Ontario and Canada's first grid scale SMR build. Uh, the SMR project at Darlington will build on Canada's decades old legacy of can-do reactors, which has helped and continues to help other countries around the world significantly decrease their greenhouse gas emissions. The list of countries includes Argentina, South Korea, and Romania, and others as well, and of course, Building and sustaining this world-class energy system ultimately depends upon a highly skilled and expert workforce. And just as our diverse energy supply ensures reliability and sustainability, so too a diverse workforce makes us stronger. And I want to close by acknowledging OSPI, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, and your membership for the important role that you play in Ontario's nuclear future. I know that as the advocacy body and the voice of the engineering profession in Ontario, OSPI's supported and provided important advice on the development and deployment of this groundbreaking SMR technology. So please know that uh, we'll continue to rely on your support and your unique expertise as we move forward with SMR development and the tremendous economic and environmental opportunities that 
they represent for our province and for our country and really the entire world. So thanks and really looking forward to the discussion uh, that we have uh, today here at this event. Well, thank you, Minister. Uh, that was great. Um, and thank you for joining us and providing us an update on the government's initiatives surrounding SMRs and nuclear energy. I just would like to take a few minutes, if you're available, to ask some follow-up questions, if that's okay. Sure. Great. So um, first off, in your remarks, you mentioned the four key pillars that the ministry is focused on. So it's, uh, if I remember correctly, reliability, affordability, sustainability, and consumer choice. So can you expand on this? And more importantly, you know, in your government's view and in your view as a minister, what does success look like? So yeah, thanks for the question and thanks for paying attention to my four pillars. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we, we know that families and businesses in the province rely on access to reliable and affordable electricity, uh, which is so important. And at the same time, they want to know that uh, the electricity that they're using and, and accessing is sustainable and, and clean uh, from clean sources. And one of the advantages of our electricity system in Ontario is that it's over 90% emissions free. Um, and, and we're continuing to build on this track record of sustainability and, and clean sources. And a key part of that work is the potential for the small modular reactors to provide that emissions free power uh, that is clean and reliable and affordable. Um, but that announcement is just one piece of our plan really for Ontario's electricity sector. It's a big piece and we're excited about uh, what it means. But uh, as I mentioned, when we took office, we were we were seeing jobs and investment fleeing the province. And uh, that was a result of skyrocketing energy prices. As, as you mentioned uh, in my introduction, I did serve as economic development minister back in 2018, 19. And at that time, almost every manufacturer located in Ontario uh, was considering getting out of the province. And that includes specifically those in the auto manufacturing sector. And we've really been able to turn things around. You know, we were down 300 manufacturing jobs in Ontario uh, because of those reckless policies. So we, we've made investments to make electricity in Ontario more affordable. The Ontario electricity rebate is one way that we're doing that. We're reducing the cost of electricity for households and small businesses by 17%. And then large industrial and commercial customers are also seeing uh, similar savings between 15 and 17 percent, and that's through another program called the Comprehensive Electricity Plan. And we also know that, um, you know, families across the province and businesses, uh, big and small, uh, want to take control of their electricity bills. So we've introduced that customer choice so that, you know, customers can select the electricity price plan that makes the most sense for them and, and helps them save on their bills. And, uh, on that note, I think it's probably important to, to recognize OSPI for your input on and, uh, and for your support of the new ultra low electricity rate option that we announced earlier this year. This is something that we talked about with Paul and, and the team at OSPI many years ago when I was the opposition critic. And so we're moving in that direction now and, and we're gonna continue to move forward with new options uh, like this that expand choice and, and help families and businesses save money. Excellent, thank you, Minister, and thank you for uh... The acknowledgement of the work that uh, OSPI and, and Paul and the rest of the energy task force has been doing. Um, and, and I am taking notes. So, <laughs> so I'm going to grill you with another question here. So uh, with the December announcement of Canada's first um, grid scale SMR at the Darlington site, Ontario is leading the way in new nuclear technologies. So we believe, and I think you agree, that this re represents tremendous economic and environmental opportunities for a province. Can you expand on the type of interprovincial and international agreements that Ontario is looking at? And more importantly, what these investments mean to engineers in this province? Yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna continue to see um, our economy get electrified and, and our, our government recognizes that, um, you know, we've increased demand for electricity uh, coming in Ontario. That's only gonna grow. And that's why we've been working so hard with all our partners including uh, the independent electricity system operator, the folks at the ISO. I was with them this morning uh, to announce uh, the Grid Innovation Fund um, projects that have been awarded with uh, the Ontario Energy Board as well. You know, we're going to make sure that we're able to meet um, that increased demand. And we believe that small modular reactor projects like the one at Darlington 
offer Ontario a tremendous opportunity to help meet this demand and, and create the good paying jobs that go along with it in fields like yours in engineering, uh, as well as reducing emissions. So it's, it's really important to think uh, though beyond just Ontario's nuclear market when it comes to new nuclear builds in Ontario and Canada, we're already leaders when it comes to exporting nuclear technology. As I, as I mentioned in my remarks with uh, exporting those CANDU reactors around the world. So we, we've already secured a major agreement uh, to invest a billion dollars in Ontario's nuclear supply chain uh, back before Christmas, um, GE Itachi, uh, BWXT Canada and Polish company Synthos Green Energy um, announced that, uh, that they'll be following Ontario's lead, Synthos will, and uh, they're going to purchase key components from BWXT Canada to build up to 10 small modular reactors in Poland. And that's really exciting news for Poland. It's really exciting news for our supply chain uh, in Ontario, which of course includes BWXT, and that um, announcement was made in, in Cambridge. So it means hundreds of jobs uh, across Ontario's nuclear supply chain. It makes us uh, the first major export opportunity of made in Canada technology towards SMR deployment. And, and it, you know, there's, there's further interest um, in many other countries and jurisdictions out there um, including in France and the US and Sweden and Estonia and the UK, they're all looking at nuclear as a, as a way to support decarbonization of their energy sectors. And I know that uh, Ontario's world-class engineers will be there to support that work. Uh, you know, the premier says it all the time. We, we live in the best jurisdiction and we have the smartest people in this province to accomplish uh, great things. And, um, you know, closer to home, we've got a great opportunity as well, Sandro, um, to, to share our expertise with other provinces that are interested in nuclear technology. And as mentioned, I was just in Regina with some of our partners on Monday, and that included New Brunswick, Saskatchewan and Alberta. And we want to help them uh, reduce their emissions as well. And uh, that's why the MOU was signed by the premiers uh, a couple of years ago now on the development and deployment of SMR technology with those provinces. And it was really exciting to finally announce our SMR strategy with those um, interprovincial partners that we have on Monday morning. So, uh, I, That's what I actually like to expand on for my third question. So again, on Monday, we learned about Ontario strategic plan for the deployment of SMRs. And you know, we're really excited. And I'm not going to argue with you or the premier about the talent we have here in Ontario, especially in the engineering sector. Uh, but can you uh, can you expand a little bit more about the plan, and specifically, you know, the other province and their premiers and your counterparts? Uh, what are they uh, telling you about this? Everybody's excited about this. There was a lot of excitement in the room at Hotel Saskatchewan. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you on uh, on Monday. But it's been years, sort of building to that to that point and a lot of discussions uh, between the, prom, the, the, the provinces since the premiers made that initial announcement uh, around Christmas time of, of, of 2019 to work together to build that vision for a, for a strong and growing economy and, uh, and a clean energy future uh, for, for our country and the world. So, so while a lot has happened in the two and a half years, um, including gaining that new partner uh, in Alberta, um, you know, Minister Ken, or Premier Kenny and Minister Savage uh, came to the table uh, about a year later. Um, the work hasn't stopped. Um, each province comes to the, the strategy with a bit of a different pathway or a different motivation even uh, for the use of SMRs, which is, which is interesting. Um, you know, the strategic plan lays out a shared vision, though, um, of the opportunity they bring as a source of, of safe and reliable zero emissions energy to power our communities and um, and meet the demands of a, of a growing economy and, and population. So in, in Ontario, as we face increasing energy demand as a result of the strong economic growth that we know we're going to continue uh, to see and increasing electrification, which we know we're going to continue to see, those SMRs are going to play an important role in providing that baseload power, that reliable, affordable baseload power for our, our electricity grid. And with job creators looking for that affordable, reliable, clean energy, it, it's a critical part of our plan to secure our um, clean energy advantage that we have in Ontario that's going to help us land new investments and in turn uh, 
create jobs across the province. In Saskatchewan, they're, they're providing an opportunity for that jurisdiction to do what's already happened here in Ontario, move away from coal generation and, and reduce emissions in that province and tackle some of the climate change targets that have been set out. Um, in Alberta, they're going to be deploying the, the, the private sector, the, the SMRs in the private sector, uh, potentially in the oil sands and, and providing reliable electricity and industrial heat um, in remote work sites in their industrial heartland, as they call it. And, um, and over in New Brunswick, uh, my home province, by the way, I grew up in New Brunswick. And interestingly, the first nuclear facility I was ever in was Point Le Pro uh, in the early 80s as a Boy Scout, if you can believe that. And here I am now as the Minister of Energy, uh, you know, overseeing the SMR project here in Ontario. But but they're looking at the next generation of advanced SMRs in my own home province in New Brunswick and, and to support their local economic development as well and, and the grid demand that they have in that province. So um, the, the other critical part of this equation is the federal government and, and everybody's asking, you know, where are the feds in this? And I know that, that, that many have been watching the federal response to see if they're going to join our provinces to fully unleash uh, Canada's nuclear advantage, because it's not just Ontario's nuclear advantage, it really is Canada's nuclear advantage. And wouldn't it be great to put that Canadian flag in there right next to our Ontario flag and export uh, these SMRs around the world. Um, many of you probably uh, saw the news yesterday as part of their emissions reduction plan. They, they did commit uh, to further discussions under the SMR action plan, which is great news. And we've been keeping them up to date on everything. Uh, that's happening with OPG and GE Itachi and other projects in the province as well. So I'm pleased to see that that was stated in their plan yesterday. And, and you know, the key steps are going to be providing federal support uh, for these provincial projects, including, you know, full access to all of the federal funding programs designed to uh, accelerate the development and deployment of clean energy technologies. And nuclear has to be a part of that. I think everybody on screen probably understands that there's no pathway to net zero without nuclear. Um, that's been you know, proven here in, in Ontario for sure. And it's gonna be proven around the world. So um, you know, the programs that they have at the federal level in, in many cases have been limited to only the renewable energy projects, but I'm going to continue to work with my colleagues across the country to get it done and ensure SMRs uh, receive that support uh, from the federal government as well. So lots happening, Sandro, and, uh, and a pretty exciting time to be in this sector for sure. Yeah, and we'll do our part to encourage the uh, feds to support this as well. Minister, uh, thank you so much. You've been so generous with your time and uh, for sharing all, all the updates and all the work that you've been doing. Uh, you've certainly been busy and uh, we encourage you to keep keep up the great work. Uh, there's still so much more to do. Uh, so thanks again for, for participating and being part of this great uh, event. Thanks very much, Sandro. Thanks to all your members uh, for all the good work you do every day in our province. Keep our lights on. <laughs> Excellent. Take care. Uh, so now uh, I think the, you know, you guys are tired of looking at our two handsome faces. So we're going to move on to today's panel. It's an honor to introduce our moderator today, uh, Mr. Paul Accioni. Paul is a professional engineer in the province of Ontario and a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering. Paul has over 50 years of engineering and management experience in the electrical power sector. Paul is a past OSPE president and chair. Paul spent 31 years with Ontario Hydro and Ontario Power Generation, where he was responsible for automation systems, computer modeling and simulation analysis for both fossil fueled and nuclear plants. Since retiring from OPG, Paul has been an electrical, uh, electric power management consultant. He has prepared energy policy studies and recommendations based on analysis of power system supply mixes and their impact on wholesale and retail electricity pricing and environmental emissions. Paul is also, you know, when he has all his free time, a volunteer and a subject matter expert on OSFI's energy task force and a great contributor to the work that OSFI does in this area. So, Paul, I pass the uh, podium on to you. Thanks, uh, Sandra. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor for me today uh, to, to discuss this important topic uh, with the audience. Uh, we have an outstanding panel uh, for, for, for you uh, with people that actually have their hands on the new technology and are, are developing it. So it's going to be a, a great opportunity to ask them questions a little later. And I hope, uh, I hope you do. 
Uh, now let, let me introduce them uh, to you. I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Catherine Cottrell. She likes to be called Kathy. So Kathy uh, is the uh, Senior Director, Technology and Information at SNC Lavalin. Her role is to lead a team uh, of innovators in developing solutions to enable her clients' success and uh, in achieving their objectives. Kathy holds a doctorate degree in chemical engineering from the University of Toronto, is a licensed professional engineer in the province of Ontario. She has over 25 years of experience in the nuclear field, which has focused on can-do reactor commercial projects, including reactor life extension, advanced fuel cycles, and advanced reactor design. Kathy is a past recipient of Atomic Energy of Canada's Awards of Excellence, uh, D.F. Torgerson Discovery Award, and uh, she holds several uh, patents in reactor uh, fuel design. She is a board member of Women in uh, Nuclear Canada. Uh, next is uh, Lisa McBride. Lisa is a vice president country leader, small modular reactors of GE Hitachi SMR Canada. In her role, Lisa is responsible for leading the collaboration with customers, stakeholders, and suppliers to deploy the BWRX 300 SMR in Canada, targeting to be the world's first operational grid scale SMR before 2028. Lisa, has over 18 years experience in the nuclear industry, starting her career with Ontario Power Generation. <clears throat> her drive and commitment have propelled her into several key leadership roles, including leading nuclear security operations for the Pickering Nuclear Generating Station, Senior Manager of Enterprise Emergency Management, Manager Labor Relations, Senior Manager of organizational, uh, Organization Design, and manager stakeholder relations for the Nuclear Regulatory Affairs Group at Ontario Power Generation. Lisa McBride is also president of Women in Nuclear, WIN Canada. In her role, Lisa provides vision, strategic direction, and oversight of the day-to-day -day operations of WIN Canada, an organization comprised of over 4,000 members across Canada. WIN Canada seeks to address three challenging goals. First, to engage and educate the public regarding safe use and application of nuclear and radiation technologies. Second is to provide professional development opportunities for WIN Canada members. And third is to promote career interest in nuclear among women and young people. Lisa is also the chair of Women for STEM, Council of Ontario Tech University. Next is David Tyndall. <clears throat> David is a professional engineer in the province of Ontario. David is the director of new build engineering at Ontario Power Generation with, with a focus on delivering the first grid scale SMR at Ontario's Darlington uh, new nuclear site and facilitating new nuclear growth at OP OPG. Additionally, David serves as the Global First Powers board of direct uh, on the uh, on Global First Powers Board of Directors, which is a joint venture between OPG and UltraSafe Nuclear Corporation, which is aiming to be the first SMR deployment in Canada with a micro-modular reactor at the Chakra River site. He is also active within the industry through COG, our can -do Owners Group, and CSA committees focused on enabling small modular reactor deployment in Canada. David has spent roughly 10 years at Pickering in various engineering and management roles of increasing accountability and authority before serving four years as the design authority for OPG's Darlington Nuclear Generating Station. Next, we have Raj Verma. Raj is head, is, is lead of the Next Gen Initiative at Bruce Power and is responsible for managing Bruce Power's future <clears throat> nuclear development program in support of provincial and federal 2030 and 2050 carbon reduction mandates. Raj has spent nearly 25 years in the nuclear industry and has held executive roles in many key nuclear suppliers, such as SNC-Lavalin, Connectrix, and Westinghouse. He has significant global experience in operations, engineering, and business development, 
with a technical background in can-do reactor maintenance and refurbishment programs. Thank you to all of our uh, panelists for joining us today. I'm uh, really pleased you could make time uh, for us. But before I uh, <clears throat> begin uh, uh, asking questions of our panelists, I, I'd like to get uh, some housekeeping uh, put uh, out here for the, for the audience. Um, we're going to have a Q&A uh, session starting at 1 p.m. You'll be able to indicate uh, that you would like to ask a question verbally by raising your hand. Uh, you can find that in the reaction section on the far right bottom of your screen. Um, and when you are called uh, to ask uh, your question or comment, um, please unmute yourself. You may turn uh, on your camera if you don't mind us looking at you and, uh, and ask your uh, question or make your comment. But because we have limited time today, please ask only one question and, and uh, provide only one brief comment uh, when you are given the floor. If you prefer, uh, as I mentioned, um, you, can, you can ask uh, the question uh, uh, through, through our uh, chat box at the bottom uh, of your screen. Uh, type your question into the chat box and, uh, and the default will direct the question when you, when you send it uh, to everyone uh, in attendance, and I will try to uh, screen through them and, and direct uh, as many uh, written questions to the par uh, panelists as time uh, permits. So uh, let me start by asking each uh, one of you uh, uh, to outline your role uh, that your respective companies have with uh, nuclear energy and specifically small modular reactors. Uh, Kathy, can we uh, start with you and SNC Lavalin? Great. First of all, Paul, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate on the panel and with my esteemed colleagues here. So SNC Lavalin is the steward of the Canadian designed Kandu reactor technology. We've been developing and licensing nuclear technology for over 60 years. In addition, we provide end to end services across the full life cycle of nuclear assets. And that includes design through delivery, through the reactors operating life and onto final decommissioning. And as the minister said, we, not only, we don't only do this in Canada, but we also do it internationally. Now, in addition to this, we use our strengths as a nuclear reactor developer to collaborate with SMR vendors and assist in completing and implementing their designs. We're currently working with SMR vendors in Canada, but our most public project is with Rolls-Royce in the UK where we have been appointed as engineering supplier. Now, outside the SMRs, we're also heavily involved in Canada in the refurbishments of the Darlington and Bruce Power reactors. And these are two of Canada's top infrastructure projects. Thanks, uh, Kathy. Uh, next, uh, David, would uh, you like to uh, brief us on OPG's uh, role? Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks, Paul, Paul, for the opportunity. And uh, again, appreciate the time and the, the opportunity to speak on the panel. You know, OPG is really uh, taking a leadership role here. Um, so, you know, my role is looking after the engineering piece. So overall accountability for the engineering that's going to occur at the Darlington New Nuclear Site. Um, and then, as you mentioned in my introduction, I also sit on the, the board of directors of our, our joint venture with uh, Global First Power. But ultimately, our, our goals here are not just one. The prize of, of, of getting a first SMR is, is a wonderful one to get, but it's, it's bigger than that. It's one and it's more. And we envision more SMRs around the, the province of Ontario uh, as they integrate with um, uh, renewables, as they integrate with all kinds of energy technologies, whether it's storage, whether it's uh, new hydro, and that's, you know, OPG's growth is not purely in the land of nuclear, but today's session is, is about SMR, so I'll, so I'll focus on that. So um, I see some of the questions coming in, and and just I, I would, would offer this to say, we do envision more, we do envision more at Darlington, we do envision more at other sites in Ontario, and no, we haven't picked the other sites in Ontario as of yet, but we will, because that's part of what my job is at OPG, is looking at 
the first project, but then looking at the subsequent plants and what's the right thing to do, where's the right thing to do it, um, obviously in consultation and, and what's the right uh, technologies to pick. Um, so, so obviously the BIBRX 300 represents a, a great choice for us in terms of the needs of Ontario and, and pursuing our aggressive continued decarbonization goals that the, the minister mentioned. Um, and that's what we're really excited about. So, you know, one of our uh, pieces of, of driving forward here is take meaningful action quickly, um, but there is no silver bullet. And, and so what I would offer is this is a great technology. It'll form the great base load. It'll do more. And we envision that um, many different types of SMRs will, will take the, the story of, of Canada and Ontario uh, as the future unfolds, including uh, both large grid scale SMRs as well as, uh, as micro reactors. So uh, maybe I'll end it there, Paul. Thanks, uh, David. And uh, Lisa, could you give us a rundown on uh, GE Attache? Sure, thank you. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this panel. So certainly at GE, we are taking critical steps uh, to power the energy transition. You know, uh, Minister talked about uh, their four, the four pillars, uh, you know, within their strategic plan. And, you know, three of those are part of the energy trilemma that, that GE is working to address affordability, reliability, and sustainability. And so, you know, we're very focused on how we decarbonize the energy sector. Um, and, you know, if we think GE globally, you know, we power one third of the world's energy today. Um, and we operate in 170 countries around the world. Um, and we really are, you know, kind of looking at how do we make sure that everyone around the world has access to those those three three things that I mentioned. But we do it in two ways at GE. Um, it's about providing the best technology the world needs today, um, and thinking about innovation and breakthrough technologies that the world will need in the future. One of those new technologies in the innovation uh, is our. SMR, our BWRX 300, that's the boiling water reactor, acts as the 10th generation and it's 300 megawatts. And it really is a key pillar of our, our energy transition leadership at GE Hitachi. Um, if we think about the electricity demand, it's expected to triple by 2050. Um, and so we need nuclear power to help meet the commitments to bring carbon emissions to zero. Um, and so we are really, you know, very excited about the opportunity in Ontario um, and how we're going to help meet our decarbonization goals as a province and as a country and how we can help really the rest of the world. Thanks, uh, Lisa. And uh, Raj, could you give us a rundown on uh, Bruce Power's role? Yeah, sure, Paul. Um, like Minister Smith, uh, I also grew up in New Brunswick, so I, lo I look forward to a good kitchen table panel chat with everybody here and, and appreciate being on here today. Um, you know, as far as nuclear is concerned, I think everybody knows about Bruce, uh, you know, large eight unit reactor site in Bruce County lies within the traditional and ter treaty territories of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation and the traditional harvesting territory of the Métis Nation of Ontario and historic Saugeen Métis. Now, as far as new nuclear is concerned, I know there's been a lot of discussion around um, what our plans are and we have uh, recently formed an organization with Bruce Power called uh, NextGen. Uh, which is responsible for all our new nuclear uh, plans as they fit into our business interests. And uh, we expect a mix of SMR, advanced nuclear micro reactors and large scale to meet the needs of 2030, 2050 and beyond, just, uh, just as all the, my other colleagues on this uh, panel have said. Now, in the short term, um, you know, our SMR outlook is we have a strong relationship with Westinghouse, which uh, uh, for the Avinci micro reactor, which uh, is a competitor of of uh, of the GFP um, um, reactor, and we we are collaborating with OPG and uh, supporting the Darlington new build as part of the Pan Canadian Initiative and other collaboration agreements. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, uh, Raj. Thanks, everyone, for those initial comments. Uh, you have all uh, been leaders in this space, and we can uh, definitely see the important roles that you have in ensuring SMR development and deployment is successful. Uh, before we start diving into the challenges and opportunities uh, nuclear energy represents and what this means for engineers and the broader Ontario economy, let's talk a little bit about, about SMR specifically. Uh, David, uh, OPG's uh, Darlington uh, new nuclear project is leading the way in the advancement of grid scale 
small modular reactors. Could you tell us a bit more about the different types of SMRs you looked at and what worked best for Ontario? Sure, that's a, a great place to start today's conversation. And, and uh, as, as Raj and, and my colleagues introduced uh, here, SMRs come in a tremendous number of different shapes, sizes, and um, technologies. Uh, you know, whether it's an advanced light water reactor to high temperature gas reactors to salt based reactors um, or other uh, technologies that are out there. When, when we did our market scan, we, we found out there was over 150 different reactor developers going on around the world in, in grid scale space alone. And so uh, obviously some of these will get weeded out. And when some of those technologies were, were simply two grad students in, uh, in, a, in a lab or, or all the way to the traditional uh, large uh, technology developers such as uh, GE, Hitachi, and, uh, and everything in between. And so really we do envision that there's going to be a, a, a big mix because each of the different technologies has a different level of readiness, uh, its ability to be licensed in a, in a timely manner. So uh, when you start looking at how to balance all of the factors um, uh, in uh, what's right for Ontario, what's right for OPG, um, that's really what drove uh, for our decision. So, you know, Rate regulated baseload asset is something that we are very passionate about for for the Darlington site in this case to to be that uh, cost effective, reliable, sustainable source of power that the the minister mentioned. So, if I take us back up a step and uh, talk about uh, uh, you know the Canadian SMR action plan that's been mentioned and the the this week's release of that interprovincial uh, strategic plan around the deployment of SMRs. Uh, for those who aren't necessarily aware, there are three streams of reactors being investigated in Canada right now are being, I shouldn't say investigated, let's just be real, they're all advancing towards deployment. And so, uh, you know, stream one is that is the grid scale uh, SMRs, roughly of the 300 megawatt, that's kind of the sweet spot to to replace a number of coal type generation uh, or fossil type generation uh, sources, but also very good from a uh, process heat perspective for, for a number of uh, industries um, as we go through, uh, looking at trying to get this reactor deployed on the grid within the decade, 2028 is the goal, and that's going to be a subsequent follower or a, a leader to that subsequent follower of, of additional reactors at Darlington, but also that enabler of, of Saskatchewan and, and, uh, and other jurisdictions to, to uh, deploy new nuclear. Uh, stream two, the, the fourth generation advanced reactors that, that, that New Brunswick is leading the initiative on, again, those ones are really focused on trying to close that fuel cycle. One of the questions that came out was how do we, how do we leverage the used fuel? Let's not call it waste, let's call it used fuel and, and taking that into the next step and looking at the technologies that can be used to, to process or continue to use that energy. And so that leverage is there. And, and we're actually working with NB Power towards those efforts as well. And so then those stream three, and that's where uh, Raj and I both talked about these micro reactors. And this is really primarily to, to phase out the, the use of diesel in remote communities and mines and, and, and establish those abilities to create microgrids, um, but not just with power. Power and heat are critical in those, uh, those environments to, to sustain uh, and improve the quality of life, but also the, the, the greenhouse emissions in those. So when you start thinking about it, uh, for Ontario specifically, we, we really need a multi-pronged new nuclear future that integrates with, with hydro and renewables to support that electrification that the minister mentioned. And so for now, you know, grid scale SMR, higher technology readiness level immediately, we need to drive this transition forward to get that base load and continue our legacy of decarbonizing the electrical grid of Ontario. That is one of the things that I'm most proud of about OPG is that ability to decarbonize the grid of Ontario. And we need those micro reactors to offset that use of diesel. Um, and you see pictures of just the black on the snow and you say, why it doesn't need to be that way. Uh, we have better technologies. The engineers around this room and in this community, in this province can solve these problems. And so we envision, uh, you know, improving that quality of life through stable, reliable electricity and heat. Um, 
really in a competitive manner with the diesel off with 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 diesel and those communities spend a lot on diesel and when you start thinking about that a single micro reactor could displace 200 million liters of diesel over its lifetime it's almost an unfathomable amount of of fuel that you start thinking about so for the future of Ontario, you know, additional grid, grid scale SMRs, uh, we're going to need more baseload uh, and, and we're going to need SMRs, uh, probably going to need large nuclear as well to, to be that source of, of, big, uh, uh, of big stable growth on, on the power. Um, and then we see the opportunity for next generation designs as well. And so I don't want anybody to think that uh, we aren't interested in advanced reactors. We are. That's part of my other jobs, other duties as required is keeping a very firm tab on where are those markets? How do they continue to advance? How are we going to help Canada with our expertise in deploying these reactors? And then looking at how we leverage them uh, in Ontario as well to, to support both the communities as well as uh, industry. And so I think that's really how I, would, how I would look at for the forward of Ontario, it's got a proud nuclear history. And I think we have an exciting nuclear future to uh, to look forward to. Thanks, uh, David. That was a fulsome uh, description. Thank you. Uh, most of our audience knows that there's been some exciting news in this space recently. In December, GE Hitachi, uh, Nuclear Energy uh, BWXT Canada, and uh, Synthos Green Energy announced their intention for BWTX Canada to build key components here in Ontario for small modular reactors, specifically for use in uh, Poland. This agreement represents about a billion dollars in contracts and mark marks the first major export opportunity of this made in Ontario technology. Lisa, could, could you tell us more about this agreement and uh, what this represents for Ontario and economic opportunities, employment benefits, and manufacturing and engineering jobs in Ontario? Thanks. Sure. Um, thanks for that. I, you know, this, it's been certainly an exciting several months. Um, you know, first and foremost, you know, we are incredibly proud to have been selected uh, by Ontario Power Generation is the technical partner for the Darlington New Nuclear Project. And, um, you know, as the world watches what, uh, what we're doing in Canada, it leads to more opportunities. And we heard the minister this morning um, talk about Canada's experience uh, with our can-do technology and supporting and deploying to other countries. This will be exactly the same. Um, and so uh, shortly after uh, Ontario Power Generation announced their decision, Synthos Green Energy stepped forward and said, we have a desire uh, to build 10, uh, 10 BWRX 300s in Poland, uh, as we know, and as we've seen recently on the news, energy security uh, in the EU nations is very, very important. It's never been more important than it is today. Um, and so that's an export opportunity. We, you know, BWXT Canada will manufacture the, the RPV and the components. Um, and so significant opportunity for jobs um, and uh, Canada's economy. I think, you know, if um, I'll reflect back, we had commissioned uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper as an independent partner to evaluate our economic impact. Um, that report is available on our website. You know, the first reactor um, in Ontario was going to bring, uh, I think, uh, our report more than 1,700 jobs. Uh, and that's just during manufacturing and construction. And then, of course, uh, there are jobs, you know, kind of during the, the long term uh, operation. And that brings about $2.3 billion in GDP. Uh, if we think about additional reactors here in Canada, you know, 1,950 jobs uh, during a four-year manufacturing construction, uh, additional 1.1 billion to the GDP. So significant boost, uh, you know, to the economy here in Canada. We definitely envision, you know, Canada is a leader uh, in the nuclear industry. Uh, we are a tier one nuclear nation. Um, and we envision Canada as the gateway uh, to the opportunities to deploy this reactor and the components. Uh, around the world. We have a strong nuclear supply chain in Canada um, and that supports uh, the full life cycle, so the full fuel cycle, which is, is unique. And so we want to leverage the talent, the expertise, the supply chain, and the opportunity for Canada um, for what we need domestically, 
uh, and opportunities to help other countries around the world. So if we think about that from uh, an OSPE perspective in terms of jobs and opportunity, you know, we certainly have, uh, there's significant engineering opportunity uh, available, right? So if we think kind of full life cycle, uh, you know, what we're doing with GE Hitachi right now, Ontario Power Generation, there's construction, there's manufacturing. So significant, uh, significant role um, to leverage talent and expertise uh, and develop the talent uh, that's required for what I call the next chapter in nuclear, right? As we, as we work towards deploying um, our SMARs uh, here in Canada and, and in other countries around the world. Thanks, uh, Lisa. Uh, Raj, uh, at uh, Bruce Power, you're meeting the challenges of climate change and uh, global energy demand through new nuclear technology, including working with Westinghouse on their eVinci micro uh, SMR. Can you talk about the role of nuclear, that nuclear energy plays in fighting climate change and achieving a net zero? Yeah, um, Paul, maybe I'll take a, d a slightly different approach to this. Um, maybe I'm give it a bit anecdotal personal side. Um, I have the uh, fortune of being a second generation nuclear. My father spent most of his career at Point La Pro and, and sort of growing up in St. John, I, you know, I honestly first went into the industry to better support my family. But it was very quickly after that when we moved to Toronto and my, my wife came here from Mexico City where she had always suffered from, from sort of pollution triggered asthma. And she continued to suffer this during the smog days in Toronto. Um, until Ontario shut down its coal plants. And we know that that's primarily because um, we restarted our nuclear reactors. And, um, and now that we have uh, three little children, and in 2019, we moved to Bruce County, um, largely because Bruce Power was actively doing their part against climate change, actively utilizing nuclear power as a way to, way to fight climate change. We just... Uh, uh, made a significant private investment of $13 billion uh, in order to refurbish the six reactors, started our overall increase of 150 megawatts, um, established a fairly significant relationship with Westinghouse, which is one of the, you know, the largest equipment designers in the world uh, for SMRs. And I think it was clear to us, especially my, my little family, um, that the climate will continue to adversely change unless unless those jurisdictions, especially those jurisdictions without sort of abundant hydro, um, unless they adopt nuclear. I don't, I just, uh, it's, you know, as far as, you know, many of us on this call or we may be a bit biased or leaning towards nuclear, I just don't, like others say, there is really no other option to get that base load without establishing a strong, a strong, um, um, initiative to to have SMRs and other technologies, and they're needed and critical. I mean, to even to add to to the the opportunity from uh, from just the from just the economic benefit. If you look at what the refurbishments have done for OP, OPG and Bruce Power refurbishments have done for the Ontario um, industry, that's only sort of half a build. So imagine once we get our entire fleet being built here with SMRs and new technologies and the impact that they will have, um, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. Thanks, uh, Raj. Um, in December uh, 2021, the federal government announced an investment of $800,000 for the First Nations Power Authority to create a National Indigenous Advisory Council as part of Canada's Small Modular Reactor Action Plan. Kathy, dating back uh, to the 1950s, SNC-Lavalin has had a long history of working with Indigenous communities across, the, uh, across every region in the country. SNC recently strengthened its approach in uh, 2019 by joining the, the CCAB Progressive Aboriginal Relations Program. And, and SNC uh, is a long-standing member of the uh, Canadian Council of Aboriginal Business. Uh, can you expand on the importance of Indigenous engagement in the development of uh, nuclear energy for us? Sure. Thank you very much, Paul, for recognizing SNC-Lavalin's commitment to not only establishing but maintaining mutually respectful and meaningful relationships among Indigenous communities, our clients, and our company. And that's not just in Canada, but it's in the other regions in which we operate. Here at home, we're very proud to be a member, as you mentioned, of the CCAB, 
And we're committed to certification under their PAR or Progressive Aboriginal Program. And I'm pleased to say that last year in 2021, we met the requirements for the phase two PAR criteria. Now, when we're going through our commitment, we are guided by the Constitution of Canada, the UN DRIP or Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and also the recommendations of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Committee. This year, SNC-Lavalin launched an Indigenous Culture Awareness and Sensitivity Training Program for our Canadian employees. And it is available on the SNC-Lavalin website, and I encourage you all to go and take a look. I completed my training back in February, and I have to say, I learned a lot. There was a lot that I did not know. So I really encourage you all to go and take a look. So in all of SNC Lavalin's work, but in the nuclear industry in particular, Indigenous engagement is of utmost importance as we continue to develop nuclear energy in Canada. Indigenous people provide a deep knowledge of the land that we are here on today and valuable input into our environmental assessments. Now, one thing that will be coming up and it's a challenge in our industry is having resources to support as we move forward with our nuclear ambitions. And by encouraging and facilitating support to Indigenous communities, whether it's something that Lisa and I have true to our heart in women in nuclear, opportunities for skilled trades and STEM careers, but not only stopping there, but continuing to support our Indigenous community in their career development. We take this commitment very seriously, and we really hope to inspire our partners to do the same. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, uh, Kathy. All right, we're uh, getting close to uh, our one o'clock uh, time for Q&A for the audience to participate, but uh, we have a couple of minutes, so I'm, I'm just going to uh, ask any of you who uh, think uh, you would like to add anything that's been said uh, by the other panelists at this time to, to comment if you would like, just wave at me and I'll, and I'll acknowledge you and uh, you can have a, a couple of minutes to just uh, add some additional points. I'll wave. Yes, yes, Lisa, go ahead. Great. Kathy gave such a great answer about what SNC Lavalin is doing um, in terms of their Indigenous engagement and their work with CCAB. You know, I think um, as an industry, you know, we are, are certainly very um, interested in being engaged with Indigenous communities. I think, you know, we're still on a learning journey um, in terms of, you know, the culture and the beliefs. Um, but, you know, if we take a step back and we think about Indigenous communities in Canada being the rights holders uh, of the land in which we live and work, um, you know, we need to start thinking about how we frame it out um, in that way. And I think this industry and the people on this panel and the companies that we represent um, are taking steps to do that. Um, it is a long journey. Um, you know, Kathy mentioned the um, the calls to action uh, from the Reconciliation Act, but, you know, as a nation, we have so much more work to do. Um, and I just wanted to amplify, you know, Kathy's comments. Um, if it's something that you're not familiar with or, or you haven't had the opportunity to go learn more, um, certainly take the, you know, a few minutes to go look at what's on the SNC-Lavalin website um, and do some research. I think, you know, as a nation, we have so much more learning to do on this. Um, to ensure that we're approaching this in a very meaningful way. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Anyone else uh, want to, we've got about uh, 60 seconds left. <laughs> no? All right. Well, then we'll give the audience the 60 seconds. How's that? Um, okay. Q&A time. Uh, thanks uh, to all of you for your insights into this technology and the roles that your companies are playing. Um, now we'll move on to our Q&A portion. Uh, re I'm reminding the audience that if you want to ask a question or comment verbally, you can do so by raising your hand um, in the reaction section on the far right of the bottom of your screen. Uh, when you're called upon, uh, please un unmute yourself and you may turn on your camera and ask your question and make a brief comment. Uh, as I also said, you may also type your questions into, into the chat box and uh, the staff at OSPI will filter uh, 
and combine the questions uh, and, and send them to me and I'll uh, direct them uh, to uh, one of the panelists. Uh, okay, so uh, I already have uh, three questions that have been flagged uh, in the chat box to me. One, uh, I think, uh, David, uh, perhaps you can take this one. Um, the question was, uh, what was uh, OPG's uh, reason for choosing the BWRX uh, uh, specifically? Maybe a little more detail than you, you mentioned in your general uh, presentation. Yeah, and sure, I can start off and, and, and quite frankly, what I can tell you is that we went through an exceptionally rigorous down selection program. And as I stated, we started off with the 150, we went down to approximately 10 that were invited formally. And together with partners from around the industry, including Bruce, we evaluated and down selected to, to a, a total of three. And we spent about a year working with each of those technology developers in progressing design and assessing the details uh, of how we got that. And this is a systematic review that didn't just cover the technical aspects of the design, but licensing and, and the cost, the cost of power, uh, the staffing requirements, all of those types of details that you would want to get into to truly understand what is it going to take to design license, operate, maintain, all the way through decommissioning, um, and look at some of those public facing issues like used fuel and, and assess all of that in a comprehensive manner. And so we were looking for a partner that was that shared our values, that shared our aggressive uh, focus on decarbonization and delivering the product. Um, one of the big drivers here, and we can never forget our one of our largest assets was the fact that we were uh, effectively the only site in North America that that possessed a site preparation license or the equivalent of um, um, uh, the ability in the US what they call uh, an early site permit. We were one of the only sites in all of North America and this is a multi year progress to do your environmental assessments and siting work. And so we needed something that we were confident would fit within the bounds of our environmental assessment. We needed something that could be on grid this decade um, uh, and driving these decarbonization goals. And that means we have to be ready to put in a license to construct uh, towards the end of this year. And so when we looked at all the various uh, pieces that come across and, and future deployments and what the best fit was uh, in line with uh, how we viewed the Ontario electrical grid, that's what really drove the, the X300 as, as the technology of choice for uh, the Darlington new nuclear project. Um, and as I say, we, we believe it's a great technology um, and, and it will be successful for years to come in multiple jurisdictions. Um, but again, we don't view it as the only technology that's going to be successful in, in SMR land. I just want to make sure that we talk about that. But that's what really led us to the, the X300 being our selection for Darlington. Thanks, uh, David. Uh, let's take one uh, of the verbal uh, requests now. Jeffrey, could you unmute yourself? And uh, I think you're already on screen. So uh, you can Thank go you, ahead Paul. and ask your question. Yeah. I'm delighted. Thank you for the opportunity. I love this panel, guys. You're doing an incredible job. We need to go there. My only comment, Raj, I think it was you that mentioned uh, we need three times the power by 2050. I think you mentioned that. My comment is this. Mother Nature doesn't have a calendar. She doesn't give a damn about 2050. We need to have this done by 2030. Otherwise, we're going to be up SHIT Creek without a paddle. That's my comment. Thank you, Paul. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Let's take another question from the chat box. Um, there was a, a, a question about uh, the multi sites that will be needed if you if we have distributed SMRs, uh, you know, per, potentially hundreds of them. Lisa, could you maybe uh, talk to that a little bit about uh, the siting uh, requirements and, and how, how uh, difficult that will be if uh, we have small modular reactors uh, in various locations? Uh, so, I mean, certainly, you know, one of the benefits about SMRs, and there's so many designs, Dave mentioned this, right, is that we can, we can you know, get them closer to, you know, where they're needed as a customer. 
I mean, right now in, in Ontario, what we're looking at is the opportunity at Darlington uh, for the first one, um, based on the reasons Dave mentioned before, having, you know, a site, uh, early work uh, opportunity at that site. So, you know, kind of going back to uh, the uh, earlier comment about we need to do this now uh, before 2030, that's where we're going to do it. So, you know, I think from other, you know, customers, et cetera, you know, there's certainly some work to be done on, you know, siting and, and where we're going to put them. Um, I can't comment on behalf of where customers uh, intend to put them. What I can do is make sure my team shows up to deliver them. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's go over to the, uh, the verbals again. Uh, Norm, uh, you've got your hands up. Could you uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask your question or make your comment? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a question, I guess, and a comment. Um, first of all, I'm a supporter of nuclear power, and just to be clear. <laughs> but uh, in, in a lot of uh, people that I talk to, the perception is that nuclear power isn't a green technology. Um, and so part of the battle is public perception and getting, uh, getting public support. Um, hearing now of shipping reactors to Poland or providing equipment for reactors in Poland, um, I just wondered if I could ask uh, candidly, was anyone caught off guard when Russia attacked a nuclear plant in Ukraine? Did that upset anyone? I mean, it just set me back. I hadn't, I hadn't anticipated that at all. Uh, why don't we uh, try uh, Kathy for uh, that one? I think, oh, I think were, that's a. Yeah. Oh, sorry. There were, there were there were two two points there. One is is nuclear really green, and the other one is what the hell is going on in the, in the Ukraine with uh, troops going into a nuclear plant. So I'll I'll attack the first one first with green, and I think it's really around education. We really just have to keep telling the story, keep demonstrating that we are providing that benefit. And Ontario itself is a great example. I think Raj was mentioning um, with his wife's condition, sorry, I forget Raj exactly what you said, but that coming to Canada and having those smog days and when we shut down the coal plants, breathing is a lot easier. So I think just from that evidence, it's clear to see that we are able to bring our technology and help benefit the environment. Uh, for the second one about the uh, the Ukraine and the attack, so I think it was Chernobyl, and then it was the other um, plant that is the largest, I think, in Europe, if I recall. But our plants are safe. I am sure there were significant safeguards in place that ensured that we didn't have any catastrophe. So as you can see from the results, even when they were supposedly attacked, uh, you Kathy, yourself. I think your, your mic just you sorry, I hit, hit mute. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I hit it by accident. It was such an exciting topic. Yeah. <laughs> I got really excited about it. Um, but I, right. I think it's shown that it's safe. And the IAEA were there to make sure that everything was okay. So I hope I answered your question. I don't know if anybody else on the panel has any other comments to add to that. I, I wouldn't mind getting a, a little yep. bit in there. Go ahead, Paul. Raj. Um, from the perspective of the Ukrainian situation i think is just devastating in its entirety um and the fact that they it's not really attacking a power plant or not that whole situation is very difficult as it stands and i think there's not much more that we that i could potentially give to that but from the green side of things what i've seen over in my career um and or public perception is that the public perception is moving towards um, a place where when I was in debating in university, we used to have this thing called a truism. And so you get into a point in debating where you can no longer debate something because as it approaches a potential disastrous effect, it's a reality. So 20 years ago, there was a debate around where is nuclear in the overall power generation. I believe as we are now and moving forward, um, nuclear has, you know, the, notwithstanding what people's perception is, nuclear is a significant portion of what we need to do. And that obviously shows, you know, OPG's 
strong relationship with uh, GE around BWRX. And so as we move even further along this timeline, my, my, uh, my belief is that while there might be a discussion around the waste and green, the reality is, is that nuclear is needed and will be needed in earnest. Thanks, uh, Raj. I guess I, I, could I, if I could, sorry, Paul, just yep, also Lisa, add, you, yep. you know, the, this is, um, you know, SMR technology certainly presents um, a zero emission option, um, particularly for countries that want to move towards energy independence. And we've seen that, right? We've seen that with the, the, the Russian Ukraine situation. Poland is one of the most polluted countries in the world. Uh, they have a massive coal fleet that they need to be replacing very, very soon. And so if we think about, you know, the need for Poland and Estonia and other countries, they're leaning towards a mix of nuclear so that they um, can get off natural gas um, and the reliance on Russia. And so, you know, from an industry perspective, we need to think about, you know, what is the geopolitical landscape and the opportunity to help other countries decarbonize and re reach that ener energy independence. Um, certainly, you know, my comments are not to be interpreted as it is disturbing what is happening um, in the Ukraine. And it's, you know, really, you know, to the, the question, you know, public perception of this industry, very, very fragile. Um, and we do a really great job as an industry of talking to ourselves. Um, and, but we are getting better about talking to the public and making sure that the public understands what nuclear energy is, why it's safe, why it's a clean option. Um, but we have, we have a lot of ground to cover because we have been you know, fairly silent for a lot of years on this. Um, as we you know, talk to ourselves, we got to get out there and talk to the public because it really is just steam. Yeah, thanks, Elisa. Anyone else uh, want to yeah. make a comment? Yep. Yeah, David. Go yeah, ahead. just one, and I think the the one um, piece, and I agree with what, what's been said. Perception. Uh, it's about education. It's about getting out there, and it, it's about changing the way we talk. Um, I think nuclear is always viewed about. We talk about risk all the time, and it's it's what's the worst thing that happens all the time. Um, and that's all fair conversation to have. I don't want to think anybody that we're not going to, um, that we should shy away from having that conversation, but it's about how we talk about this. One of the things that's unique about the nuclear industry and the regulations of it is we account for everything. And this isn't to slag other technologies or other sources of energy or anything like that, but they aren't held accountable for the total life cycle of, of, of the, the product. And so I think it's a very interesting concept that we talk about when we go to license a reactor, we have to talk about all the way to decommissioning it and what it's going to look like at the end. And so that's not the same concept that happens in other industries. And so we are held to a higher standard for all very good reason. And, and, I, and I love that part about being in this industry, but we have to learn how to talk about it in a way a that is constructive and uh, and getting out there in front of the public and, and really starting at young age and that's part of a critical part of our outreach program in dnnp is, is and that's the darlington new nuclear project is working with all of the various communities uh and educating uh both through academia through public outreach i think i have three public information sessions next month where we're getting in front of the community and just talking and answering and being vulnerable to answer those questions. And that's one of the reasons why I was happy to participate today is ask questions. It's, it's how we all learn. Yeah, thank you, uh, David. Yeah, I think, I think one, of the, one of the problems that, that um, everyone has, but specifically the nuclear industry is this word green has come to mean to people some, some energy source that doesn't disturb the natural environment at all. And unfortunately, there's no such thing. I mean, even solar and, and wind uh, facilities, they require a lot of mining to put those things together and much more mining, in fact, than a nuclear plant. So, so no, no energy production system is zero impact on the environment. So I think it's unfortunate uh, that that it's got that connotation because I think what, what we all wanna look for is an energy source that minimizes the impact on the environment. Um, and and uh, the question then is is nuclear uh, 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 does 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 nuclear have value as a component in the energy mix? 
and I, I guess uh, we're we're speaking to the to the converted here that it does, but the public needs to be convinced of that also. Uh, let's uh, go back uh, to the uh, to the hand uh, hand signals. Phil, uh, you've uh, asked to uh, comment. Could you unmute yourself yeah. and go yeah. ahead? Yes, uh, I think I'm unmuted now. Yeah, uh, I wanted to to ask. Undoubtedly, in terms of carbon reduction, uh, electricity is the answer. I wonder if you have some good concrete figures. I looked at what the cost of natural gas will be even in 2030 with uh, the uh, extra tax on it. It still seems to me, even with the advantage of heat pumps, electric is still more expensive. How do you, like, I'm an amateur at this. I, I we rent some houses, so I have to know what's going to be effective in the future. But does anybody have some good calculations comparing the various search sources of energy in 2030? And hydro uh, is great at producing. Getting it to you is is an expensive proposition. So I guess that's what, if anybody has something written out, it sure would be helpful for somebody looking forward to say what's the best future it may be at the moment i would say it's even cheaper to stay with uh, natural gas and write it off in 10 years even if uh, the government decides to put higher taxes on uh, carbon uh, in the future i believe in the long run though electricity is the way to go if we just get a little more cost effective thank you thanks phil any any uh, particular uh, panel on a panelist want want to tackle that one or i'm going to sign it <laughs> Kathy, do you want to do you want to try uh, to answer that for uh, for uh, uh, Phil? I think it was yeah. I, I will try. I don't know if I am the best person for this. I um we did a report in 2021 that looked at what it's going to take to get to net zero, and that's available on our website. I don't know if it has all of the data that you're looking for, but it might be a good source just to check it out and see if that can answer any of your questions. Um, I don't right now have any data that I could point to, but that might be a good place to start. Thanks. Alrighty, uh, let's uh, go back to the uh, chat uh, questions. There, there was a question uh, relating to um, spent, spent fuel and could it be reused? It's been discussed already by, by a couple of the panelists. Um, I, I, I guess uh, we, we heard uh, that, that New Brunswick, I think David mentioned New Brunswick was uh, going to be uh, looking at developing these uh, closed, closed fuel cycle uh, reactors. Uh, David, maybe could, could you just, uh, or if one of the other panelists has, has a, a strong interest in it, could also comment on, on closing the fuel cycle. I, I understand uh, in New Brunswick, they're looking at two reactor types. One doesn't fully close the, the, the cycle and one does fully close the cycle. Uh, there are more exotic reactors that will take longer to develop and, and license. But uh, David, could you start maybe by just commenting on, on the, the spent fuel uh, issue and uh, uh, will, it, will it be uh, as big a problem in the future as it is today? So, so spent fuel is probably going to be the single, uh, one of the top two, maybe the single largest uh, um, uh, discussions as we license new reactors. Um, I think we've seen, um, you know, the NWMO is the Nuclear Waste Management Organization is progressing towards the Deep Geological Repository um, and what that means and how that's progressing. But, but that's, I'll call it the longer term. In the interim, you still have to do something with um, uh, used used fuel. And so uh, lots of commercially available ways to safely store and manage used fuel. We've been doing it for uh, many, many decades. Uh, and it's an area where we do lots of research. So, you know, OPG also started the Canadian Center for Nuclear Sustainability that's looking at, looking at decommissioning uh, as well as uh, we just recently renamed our nuclear waste organization uh, within OPG to our nuclear sustainability solutions because we are passionate about making um, this sustainable. So when you think about used fuel, yeah, there's lots of discussion about closing the fuel cycle. Um, reprocessing of fuel uh, is something that really has not been done in Canada. There's very few countries that actually reprocess fuel today. 
And a lot of that has to do with the fact that when you have the ability to reprocess, you can take it to another level, which becomes uh, an international safeguards concern. So reprocessing is something that is going to be a, uh, it's, it, I think it's needed. Uh, quite frankly, if nuclear takes off uh, like we expect it to, uh, you know, how many hundreds of years of uranium do we have left in the world? You're going to have to look at reactors that close the fuel cycle, whether those are fast spectrum reactors uh, that, that can breed their own uh, fuel or whether they are looking at some form of reprocessing. So, you know, we are passionate about doing this. We are um, uh, investing in some of the research that goes and supporting the research that goes into developing these fuel processing um, uh, reprocessing, you know, uh, techniques in order to, to look at it for the future. I think it's going to be very important. I think it's a, it's a, a long road to get to, um, to reprocessing here in, in Canada, but I think it's going to be achievable and it's something that we need to continue to push forward and work with the policymakers on, on developing, uh, here in Canada. So I'm, I'm excited by the prospects of it. Um, and I think it's just going to take a lot of, a lot of smart people, uh, a few more years to kind of get to the spot where we know that it is commercially viable, uh, that it is safe and that we can license it here in Canada. And I think we, you know, I, I'm confident we can get there. Thank, thanks, David. Anyone else want to say a word before I move on to the next question? No? Okay. Uh, Wendell, I think you were uh, waiting for a while. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question or make your comment? Thank you very much for the opportunity. First of all, hats off to all of you. I've been monitoring and following this development for the last 10 years. I remember reading the action committee report from the government back in 2018. A lot of, lot of uh, activity, but not much happening for the last three years. The concern I have now, I want to bring you back to the engineering level. There's a lot of high level political discussion. But as an engineer, I'm looking at 2028. Having been in R&D for 30 years, there's Murphy's Law. What can go wrong will go wrong. Are we overly optimistic or are we pooling all our engineering resources to make this happen? Six years in this industry is not a long time to develop. In other words, what we have is what is going to be put out there. There's no time to develop anything new. It has to be based on existing technology that's proven that can be licensed. As you said, by the end of this year, you have to have a license for your site. So what assurance do we get? That I want this thing to happen, but I don't want any delays. I don't want to say, yeah, we need another two years. Then there's an opportunity blundered. And as as just, I know we are overly optimistic, but I would need assurance from Lisa, from Kathy, <laughs> from David. We have the technology. It's mature enough. We can put it out and have it working by 2028. Please tell me if you're going to make it happen. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Wendell. Maybe if you don't mind, I'm going to direct that to Lisa since uh, she's sure. the proponent of the 2028. <laughs> Go right. ahead, Lisa. Yeah, so definitely, you know, I, I um, Dave talked about kind of the OPG selection kind of from 150 down to, to us. You know, I believe we will, we will be able to do this. I know we will. Uh, we have experience. We have 67 reactors in 10 countries around the world. We have experience in licensing and deploying in, in various countries. We understand how to meet in-country needs. If we think about the BWRX 300, it is the 10th generation of a boiling water reactor. Um, so 90% of our components are based on designs that are already in operation. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we have, you know, been able to essentially shave off a, a, a big chunk of that curve. If we think about Ontario power generation and the site, uh, the site prep, you know, we've shaved off, I don't know, six or more years in the schedule because they, they have a site with an EA right. already in place. So, you know, we are very much ahead of the curve. And if we think about SMR, right, it's, it's not big capital conventional nuclear projects. We're talking 50% less construction materials. Um, which helps with, you know, schedule, the modularization certainly helps. Um, but I would say in terms of our reactor, it's our technology, um, it's our experience um, that will get us uh, to 2028. 
Thanks, uh, Lisa. Yeah. I just heard a, a, a sigh of relief from David, so that's good. <laughs> well, I mean, it's always awkward when the so, customer's on the call, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, so I, I, yeah, and I think it's a it's a great point, and I, I want to be very clear. So, right now in OPG's process, this is our target. We are driving towards this, and um, it, and we are committed to delivering this new nuclear. But we're not. But but I want to be clear. We're not going to sit here and. Uh, you know, uh, promise things that we we can't deliver on. So this is our goal. We have to go back to our board in November of this year and really show that we can, what we're going to deliver and precisely at what cost and what does that look like to the rate payer, right? right? So that's, we don't have an approval to build a plant today. We have an approval to do the plan, to show that it can be done, to develop the design, to build that commitment. And then we're gonna really show the, the everyone, this is what we're gonna do by exactly when and commit to it. Just like we did with Darlington refurbishment, on time, on budget, that's gotta be the future of new nuclear. We can't right. do we can't do the Vogel. We can't do the Oiki Ludo. We can't right. do the Fomenville <laughs> because that is going to be the death of the nuclear industry. Exactly, of the yes. Projects that are over there. So 2028. Yeah. Our aspirational drive towards target, that's what we want to do because that's what the client, that's what Mother Nature needs. I think somebody brought it up earlier. That's what Mother Nature needs. That's what our grid needs. And so yeah. we are going to drive towards that. And I'm, you know, when we commit to going back and we make the announcement that we're going ahead with the approval to submit our license and do our construction, that's going to come with a number to it. And that's going to come with a date to it that we can stand and we're confident in our public uh, facing uh, towards and, and we're going to commit to deliver on it as a team. And, and for all the reasons Lisa said, you think about the, the, the history, the amount of R&D that's outstanding, but I do want to cautious us. It can't be everything it always has been. We do have to innovate. We do have to push. We do have to do things differently to enable this. We can't build for 12 years. We've got to build in three years. Right. And so thinking about how we do that and what techniques and leveraging the expertise from not just nuclear. So, you know, GE's hired nearly 100 engineers in Ontario already. So there you go. They're growing. OPG is going to be hiring ex externally soon for additional roles to support these things. Um, <laughs> but also, we aren't just interested in nuclearites, if you will. We have to learn the lessons from other industries. So we have folks that have worked in oil and gas, that have worked in, in chemical, that have worked in other industries to show us what this is. And it's about treating nuclear um, different a little bit here. And that's where focus on the stuff that's nuclear and do nuclear very hard, but let's not over nuclearize every aspect of a plant when it's not required because the safety cases of these plants are very different from the reactors that we are used to operating today. Yeah. So it's about efficiency, good judgment, doing it fit for purpose. So what do you need to do it? And leveraging those lessons and talents from the, the broader industry. And we're bringing those in through the people we hire, through the people, our partners, and the, the, the partners we've chosen to work with and, and that GEH is choosing to work right. with. Thanks, uh, David. We, we rolled past our uh, deadline and I'm gonna have to apologize to Bob and Jeffrey for not getting to their uh, hands uh, raised. Uh, I apologize, but we do have a hard deadline at 1, 1.30 and there's a few more things that have to be done uh, uh, before we close off. Thanks to everyone on the panel. Uh, thanks to the audience for the great questions. And now I'd like to pass the microphone uh, back to OSPI's uh, CEO, uh, Sandro uh, Perusa for some closing remarks. Hey, thanks, Paul. Um, oh, there he is. Good. There he am. Yeah. <laughs> there, I'm here. So thanks, Paul. Uh, on behalf of the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, I'd like to first thank uh, Minister Smith for his update, as well as Dr. Kathy Cottrell from SNC-Lavalin, Lisa McBride from GE Hitachi, David Tyndall from OPG, and Raj Rama for Bruce Power NextGen for your expertise, for sharing all the knowledge, for answering the questions, and participating on today's panel. I know we ran out of time. Uh, I, we could probably spend another two hours talking about this. I do promise you that this will not be the last time we talk about this and there'll be future events uh, talking about not just uh, SMRs, but looking at the entire energy mix and what uh, we need to do in the future to address 
the climate crisis we're all facing. Uh, thank you for being leaders in this space and thank you to all our participants, uh, the viewers today for your questions as well. I wanna thank a mo uh, take a moment to thank all our generous sponsors of National Engineering Month. Uh, today is the 30th, that means we have one more day. So uh, we have some more events scheduled for tomorrow. So uh, please check out NEM Ontario, so nemontario.ca. Uh, to see what events we have tomorrow. So thank you all. Have a wonderful afternoon and a wonderful rest of March. Take care.